If I haven't had opportunity to meet you before, my name is Greg DeMay, one of the pastors here. Um, I promise this message will be exclusively in English from here on out. Uh, it's a big and beautiful world that our Lord made and amazing to hear just in this very room um, the languages, the history, the countries that God has drawn for just our little church and congregation and family right here. So our church believes that God speaks through the Bible, first and foremost. That is our rule for faith and life. And what the Bible intends to teach, indeed it is 100% true and beautiful and pure in its intent and its teaching and truth. We are also what's called a confessional church, which means that we voluntarily and humbly submit to teachings that have existed in the body of the church for 2,000 years. When we say the words of the Apostles' Creed, that is one of three kind of church-wide confessions um, that have been around for many, many years. The Bible is up here. The creeds, as a way of summing up what are in the Bible, is a giant step below. And then below the creeds are what we call confessions. And in the Reformed Church, of which this little congregation is a part, there are three Reformed confessions. One of them is called the Heidelberg Catechism. Many folks in this room went to catechism class growing up. A catechism is simply this, good spiritual questions and solid answers that come from the Bible. Um, during these two months, we are going through the foundational lines of the Apostles' Creed because they point to common spiritual ground and faith that has been shared by brothers and sisters all over the planet. The line for today is, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Um, if you would ask me this question, it's in yellow, I am going to respond with the answer that comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. If we would ask all together. I, I should have turned around first. Here's the question. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic? Great question. Here's the catechism's answer. I believe that the Son of God, Jesus, through his spirit and word out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world unto its end, that's a long time, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a community of those chosen for eternal life and united in the faith. And of this community, I am and always will be a living member. That's a beautiful statement. I, I believe this. What if I leave this church and do something like really heinous later today? Will I be thrown out instantly from the community of the Holy Catholic Church? No, because it doesn't depend on my behavior or weakness or strength. It depends on Jesus' choice to gather a holy, separate, Catholic, worldwide or universal family or church or community for himself. One more question, if you would read this one too. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that believers one and all as members of this community get to share in Christ and all his treasures and gifts. That's awesome and hopefully makes you feel like it's a good decision to be part of a church or come to a church. You get to, as part of the community, share in Christ and all his benefits and gifts. Like That is no small thing. It's like having the world's greatest parent times 100. Like You get to be part of Jesus' family. Secondly, that each member should consider it a duty to use these gifts that come from Jesus readily and joyful for the service and enrichment of other members, brothers and sisters. So what does it mean to be part of this family, this worldwide family? You benefit from everything that Jesus has done and that he's giving you his grace, his goodness, your skill, your winning personality, uh, your education, your professional training. All of these are good gifts for Jesus. And then the second part, you are called upon as a member of this family, not to just enjoy it for yourself, but to share it with others 
for the sake and the benefit and the life of the world and the family that Jesus cares so much about, which is exactly why we're doing this survey right now to help promote this very thing. So if that's what it means, why do less and less, fewer and fewer Americans want to be part of a church these days? Not just come to church on a Sunday morning, which is getting less and less for sure, but also belonging to a church, saying like, Yep, I'm part of a church. I played golf this past week with three guys, um, two of them I knew before, um, awesome guys. None of them were born in this country, um, actually. And all three said, I grew up in a Christian house. I believe in God. I'm a spiritual person, but I don't go to church anymore. People feel uh, morally bound to tell me this, like on the fifth hole when they find out that I'm a pastor. You can just like see their wheels turning like, oh no, what did I say when I hit that bad shot? Um, For my part, when I'm playing golf, anytime I hit a good shot, I'm like, that's what happens when you go to church once a week, (laughs) all right? Dudes are like, oh, maybe, uh, maybe I should think about this. Um, As I ask a few gentle questions, about their history and what's going on currently in their life, um, kind of what they start picking at is that they've noticed or they've experienced that humanly speaking, the church has all kinds of problems. They've experienced nonsense or some corruption or some abuse or some egomania. And they have opted to say, like, yep, I still believe in God, but I don't think I can deal with the human part of this community. And I ask this question, what if the church, and we do have problems, every church has problems, the the church, humanly speaking, no end of problems. But what if the church is more than meets the eye? What if the real church, as God can see it as Jesus is forming and shaping and purifying it, what if that church is truer and stronger and more beautiful and pure than what our little human eyes and vision can detect? What if that's the real church? In the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9, it gives one of the Bible's many pictures of the church as God sees it. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that nobody could count. From every nation, every tribe, people, and language, had a little foretaste of this this morning, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes, free of sin, holding palm branches in their hands. Like, this is just a tiny glimpse of the church as God sees it washed pure in God's presence. Palms of praise. This is the big cosmic picture of the church. And on good days, even a little congregation like ours, even a little family like ours, gets a tiny little glimmer of glimpse, a microcosm of what God sees and knows and holds. Here's some words to one of the first churches in the city of Rome nearly 2,000 years ago. Each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, right? You have hands, you have feet, nose, hair, maybe hair. Okay. So in Christ... We many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. For sure that's true on the big level, but this was also true in the little first congregation of Rome, that the members of Rome, the brothers and sisters in Rome, 1950 years ago, belonged to each other, and God gave a variety of gifts in that little community, and 2,000 years later, here we are. Some of us have well-organized minds, 
Other of us are wild people, like my friend Jeff Klein. Others of us have musical gifts. Others of us speak many languages. Others of us have gifts that come from countries of origin that are not the United States of America and therefore see and experience reality different than the majority of us. God is building his church, and it's a body, and there's a beautiful variety and diversity, even in the smallest congregation. And if God is building a body, if God is building a church, I ask you, ultimately, who or what is going to stand in the way? Is God going to fail in building a church for himself? Thank you very much, sister. God is not going to fail. Despite the imperfections and corruption and problems, if God is building it, who is going to knock it down? Well, there are forces in this world that are arrayed to do exactly that. Have you ever played a game of Jenga? You know what this is? It's like a wooden tower. There's little horizontal wooden pieces, and you slide one out, and then you back slowly away from the table, and then someone else has to slide one out, cross their fingers, and back slowly away from the table until some sucker, pardon my language, uh, takes one out, and the whole tower falls down. And then, I don't know, if you're like my family, you, make, you humiliate them further or make them eat some concoction that you've brought together from leftovers in the refrigerator. I'm not suggesting this. It's just an added fun add-on. Uh, well, it can feel like, as a Christian, that being part of the organized church, the church as we see it, is these days kind of like playing a game of Jenga. You know, fewer people are coming. Um, you know, Sabbath patterns aren't quite what they were. People don't give to the church they did a couple generations ago. The Bible is really hard to understand. It used to be that like half the people on my block went to church, but now like I feel like I'm the only one. And then beyond that, there's things like massive pastor abuse scandals. I'm not just talking about the Roman Catholic Church, but like right here in Chicago, have you read the news about like big churches in Chicago in recent years? It is a sad story. Maybe there's a little financial malpractice in somebody's church that you find out, or there's some hot gossip, or, you know, the pastor tries getting people to do stuff based on guilt and shame rather than gratitude. Ever been around a church like that? Maybe the leaders are openly self-righteous and hypocritical. Churches start talking more about politics than they do about Jesus and the beauty of the gospel. And you just like feel the pieces coming out of the Jenga tower. Is it going to stay standing? Of all the negative forces arrayed against the church these days, however, um, there is one that I'm going to comment on briefly because in... Uh, tackling the foundation of the creed. I'm trying to speak words about how to live the creed as embodied people. And this is visceral. It is the darkness of pornography. Porn is a destructive force in our culture, around the world, every corner where the internet is available these days. It affects young, old, male, Female, married, single, gay, straight. Porn is so parasitic and dark that literally it's been customized for every single post-pubescent human being. I don't intend this to be a guilt trip, but some direct talk so that we can embrace the beauty of the church and push this force that would seek to pull all the Jenga pieces out at once, push that force further into the darkness where it belongs. Um, these days, here's some current unfortunate statistics, 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view pornography on a regular basis. So I know this, and I know looking out at our congregation every single week, this is part of 
what we bring into the room and into community with us. Of Christian adults 18 to 24 years old, 76% have actively searched for pornography in the last two weeks. And 33% of women, lest we think this is only a guy problem, 33% of women under the age of 25 have searched for pornography of some kind in the last few weeks. So this is here, it's with us, and I'm here to tell you, like, if this is part of your life, you're not alone, and Jesus wants to bring you, all of you, into his light and into his love. He wants to bring you to his table, to be near you, and to give you what really will satisfy you. Briefly, here's a few reasons why pornography stinks and is parasitic. You know, God gives good gifts, and the gift of sexual sexuality and sexual energy that God gives pretty much every post-pubescent human being, that is meant to be a force of good in your life. Pornography is not something new and inventive. It is a parasite that steals that good energy that God would intend for you and the world and it twists it. Pornography harms women. Most women filmed in the porn industry do so for six months or less because of the physical and emotional and mental toll on their persons. And there is a close link between filming in the pornography industry and human trafficking. Because when we're on a computer, it seems like just at home, in a room, things are quiet, I'm not hurting everybody, anybody. The ugly truth is that the manufacturing of pornography hurts millions and millions and millions of women every single year. Pornography harms kids. First exposure to pornography in the USA is now age 11. Usually it's unintentionally. This is hardcore pornography, by the way. Usually it's unintentionally. And if you become a regular viewer of pornography, um, the possibility of demonstrating verbal or physical aggression starts multiplying exponentially. Pornography harms girls. Girls, more than guys, this will not be a big shocker, get requests and texts and messages not only to view pornography of someone else, but to take photos of themselves and share or sext those pictures. Speaking directly to young adults at this point, if you are a young girl, if you are a teenager in the midst here, um, maybe on some level I can appreciate that there might be a moment of flattering that comes if a request comes in. You do not want to do that. You just do not want to do that. And God gave you young women, a precious gift of your body that is not meant to be minimized into a screenshot and shared. If you've ever been tempted to ask somebody else for a picture like that, for Jesus' sake, honestly, for Jesus' sake, don't do it. Do not ask. Don't put somebody in that position And if you ever have, just wipe your phone, delete your phone. No human being can bear the burden of having that kind of leverage over somebody else. It's for God to know every part of us, not for us to have little squares of pictures of somebody else. Pornography harms men and boys. Men do view more pornography than women, and it literally messes up your brain and messes up your body the more porn you view. In the 20th century, the previous century, erectile dysfunction was virtually unheard of for men under 40. Today, 30% of 15 to 40-year-old men experience this. It literally is screwing up our brains and screwing up our bodies. Pornography harms marriages and relationships, porn use is typically conducted in secret. 
It leads to deception, stretching the truth, or lying. It invites a corner of darkness into your relationship or into your house. And pornography harms the church because everything I just mentioned, we carry around and it comes here. Here's one of the most amazing things about Jesus, though. Jesus was never tainted or corrupted or polluted or made unclean by the sin or immorality or bad judgments or trouble that anybody carried in on their shoulders and brought right up next to him. In fact, exactly the opposite happens. When we come as imperfect, immoral, troubled people into the real presence of Jesus, the exact reverse happens. Jesus doesn't become unclean and tainted by our trouble. We become clean, and Jesus offers healing for our trouble. I'm hoping the majority of people in this room have had this experience at some point, that when you draw near to Jesus and we're just about to come to his table. This is what counts today. This table, the presence of Jesus, his body and blood. When we come to Jesus, no matter what we are carrying, no matter how undeserving we might feel, Jesus will not be made unclean. Jesus will not take a step back. Ho, 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 ho. Jesus will actually take a step forward, embrace you, and impart his gift of righteousness and grace, as much of it as you are willing to accept and take. That is the truth I know. This is also why I love to keep coming to church. And I think everybody should be part of a church. Because we are all carrying something. And in most phases of our life, when we speak of the something that we're carrying, the stuff that taints us, it does make people take a step back, or it does drive people away. But in the church of Jesus, where radical hospitality in Jesus' name is here for everybody carrying everything, the exact reverse of the way the world works can happen. If you need more freedom than what is going to be possible for you today, I want to offer a few quick words. Number one, some Christian brothers in Texas started something called Triple X Church. The website is appearing on the screen, xxxchurch.com. If you walk out of this room and realize, like, man, I need more light in this corner of my life, go there, surf that site. Connect with somebody. If you are a guy, I would offer my time, Pastor Jeff's time. We would love to sit with you and help discern, like, where do I go from here? If you are a woman, I'm going to offer our coffee break leaders. I'm going to offer our director of care, Karen Rivadonera. Like, talk to somebody sooner rather than later. Things that we can do when we're all together that are, like, anti the spirit of pornography. Like, when we come to church, I think it's super healthy to call people brother and sister. Like, as a sign of affection and respect. Brother Jeff. Sister Amy, Brother Jake playing the organ this morning. Like, this is like a safeguard so that we relate to each other with dignity and respect and with the love that Jesus, who founded our family, so we reflect that toward one another. I encourage appropriate levels of physicality, like fist bump people after church. Like, if you know somebody reasonably well, like, give them a side hug. Right? This works out different in different cultures, and we Americans get super creeped out really easily, and rightly so, given what I've said today. But like, we need to actually like, touch each other and be near each other spiritually and physically. It helps us be healthy and not retreat into little corners of darkness. And on a regular basis, as a sign of health, and intimacy and forgiveness come to Jesus' table. It is the place where, both metaphorically and literally, I believe, the gift of God's grace is right here for you as a tangible reminder that Jesus came from heaven to earth 
gave his righteous, perfect, sinless body and life on a cross, that he shed his sinless blood for you to take in and imbibe and eat. You are not going to defile the body of Christ. The body of Christ can make you holy. This is why Hebrews 10 puts it this way. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That is my hope for this last 20 minutes of babbling that I've done, that it might spur some of you on toward love and good deeds, and specifically to let you know as a Christian person, there is no topic that is off limits for us to talk about as brothers and sisters. This would be a huge service in driving back the darkness. And we should not giving up, give up meeting together. We love you if you're on live stream, but we wish you were here. Right? One of our goals for this year is to be here three out of four if you are a part of this community because we need physically to be together. But encouraging one another all the more as you see the great and final day approaching. So out in the wider world, it may seem like the visible church is leaning like a tower of Jenga. But God, but Jesus is still coming near and Jesus is building a body for himself and he will not be denied. Amen.